Thank you so much for inviting us to speak at the Appleton Space Conference. What an ex amazing program. I'm enjoying it so much. Um, my name is Sharon Liebman, and I'm going to be joined by Sophie Bartlett from Cardiff University. Um, I'm one of the founding directors of Explorodome, a space outreach organization, and I co-created the EU Horizon 2020 program, Our Space, Our Future, which is currently in delivery in Wales and in England, uh, Denmark, Portugal, and Italy. So I thought I would start with this slide, and this is where I started my journey into inclusion with STEM. If we can turn to the next slide, um, and it's a quote from the TISME studies in 2013, um, and to be honest, not much has changed, but even then we'd already known for a while uh, that our science education and engagement practices had been excluding whole sections of society. So the range of students who felt that science is for them or feel that science was something they could engage with or contribute to or was an aspirational goal for their future is, uh, is not so diverse. Uh, so our vision with the consortium, and here you can see the consortium involved, um, it, with Our Space, Our Future was of a society that enables and empowers all students, regardless of gender, ethnicity, disability, or socioeconomic background, to consider a career related to space science as a relevant, attainable, and exciting aspiration for their future. We really took an evidence in, uh, uh, an evidence informed approach from the start to target schools with lower science capital. And um, those students, I suppose, from more underserved groups, uh, which did in fact vary from countries and, and between different regions. Our outreach program is working with multiple engagements. So working with the same students and the same providers many times to kind of build that uh, relationship, to build that trust and support this identity change for students who may find space interesting, which is a huge win and a huge hook, but they don't feel that it could be something for their future. So as a first step, we did an in-depth literature review uh, to ask the question of what type of activities and approaches seem to work in terms of space engagement for our target audience. And the review took over 1,100 reports and published studies about space and astronomy science engagement interventions. Um, we went through a selection process, critical appraisal, found a final 16 really robust studies, and we distilled these three recommendations. So just to run through these, promoting scientific and inquiry and real science skills. So higher order skills like problem solving and critical thinking, allowing space science to be creative, exploring big unanswerable questions with students without giving the answers and without giving lists of facts and really forefronting these key science skills of reasoning and thinking and ideally staying practical and hands-on and interactive at the same time. That was something we really wanted um, to incorporate into our space, our future. Uh, we wanted to engage with teachers parents and communities, so with wider influences. And this is really key for us, not seeing the child in isolation, but working with the child and their teachers and ideally wider teachers. So not just science department, we've had uh, we've had Scotch egg planets from the food de tech departments and all sorts, um, but also ideally families too. So our plans to include the child, their teachers, their carers, parents, siblings, peers, bring in a real community approach. And then the one that really resonates in the literature at the moment, at the most, uh, was to make it relevant, make space science relevant for your students. Personalization, localization, working from student interests interest, and constantly challenging the accidental lapsing into white male Western space science. So working with the cultures and the perspectives that the students bring uh, and, and going back to that um, science capital approach. And this led to more co-creation with some students during content development for some or for others. It was about bringing in uh, local and really relatable role models um, and career discussions into their interactions. Uh, but that relevance of space science was really important. Now, hands up at this point, this is very much the ideal from the research and the principles that we stood by and we aimed for. My goodness, COVID has crimped our grand ambitions, particularly in community events and family festivals that were going to be run by our students. Um, and with low capacity from the consortium members, let alone from the schools and teachers we work for, it has been really hard not to replicate the easy wins and just lapse into business as usual. So coming into a school with a space show and doing something to an audience rather than making that drive from their interests and their choices. And that takes time. 
And that is very hard to do at the moment from schools. It's very hard to ask for. But we are still in delivery and we're in delivery at the moment, soon to finish next month. Whether or not we've made a difference with our approach to shift from this interest in space science to a real identity shift um, actually remains to be seen. But in order to share what we know so far uh, and the evaluation approach that we have in, in place at the moment, I'm going to pass to Sophie Bartlett from Cardiff University. Thank you, Sharon. Um, yes, yeah, so I'm Sophie Bartlett from Cardiff University and I'm uh, running the impact evaluation of the R-Space, our future project. Um, it's a huge part of our programme because um, we wanted to not only identify what our space, our future has done, but what this perhaps means for any future endeavours um, and any similar programmes, whether they be space related or otherwise. And although we're engaging with the students, we're also engaging with te uh, teachers and a public audience. I'm going to talk to you mostly about what we've done with our students so far. And the key approach we took was to measure their attitudes towards space science, both before and after engaging with the R-Space, our future interventions. So what you can see here is the front and back of our student postcards, which are essentially an informal survey to trick students into doing a very boring questionnaire. <laughs> so it essentially comprises of a series of Likert scale items, and these relate to five aspects of students' attitudes. So one of them is interest. So is space science interesting as a topic to these students? Relevance, is it important to they themselves, but also to society more broadly? Their accessibility of it. So who do they perceive to work in the space science industry? What kind of people are they? Their possible selves. So this isn't about what they want to do, but what they feel they are capable of doing. So could they themselves pursue a career in the space science industry? Do they feel they could develop the skills, whether they want to or not? And then the future aspiration aspect looks at actually their desires and whether they have any aspirations to pursue those in the future. Then on the back of the postcard, we obviously have a drawing element. Um, and this asks students to draw themselves in a science lesson and explain in these little clouds how they're feeling at those times. So this is just, again, a bit of an identity of uh, a bit of a sense of their identity in science. So whether they're drawing themselves on their own, are they, what's their facial expressions? Are they sad? Are they with their peers? Are they doing an experiment? Are they kind of sat in a very didactic classroom looking at the teacher? Um, these very informal touches actually reveal a lot of valuable information about how these students are feeling. So as of the end of March this year, we had collected the baseline data from 1,365 students that were involved in our, our space programme. And of these students, we saw a relatively even split according to the male and female genders. Um, we did have quite a wide distribution of students in terms of their age, but the majority were 12 years old. Um, so most of the students we were targeting are in this kind of transition period from primary to secondary schools. And then this table here essentially just summarises students' responses to all the attitudinal statements, um, and I've ordered them according to what were the most positive, so who strongly agreed and agreed with them the most. Um, and here we can see that the top statements typically relate to science being an international industry, space science being an international industry, and that people generally think quite quite positively towards it. They find it an interesting subject. So this was promising, but not surprisingly, we see this all too familiar finding that despite these positive um, attitudes in terms of their interest and its importance, they were not keen on pursuing a career in that specific field. And this is just emphasizing this point that we're trying to make today is that it's interest that isn't enough to kind of pursue these students towards careers. And this finding was seen um, even when accounting for individual country differences as well. Um, you may also be familiar with the Space Awareness Programme. So this was um, a previous Horizon 2020 initiative that ran from March 2015 to February 2018. And they had a goal to increase the number of young people that chose space-related careers. So given the similarity of their objectives to ours, um, their evaluation methods have been very influential to ours. We've also worked very closely with Jen Dewitt, who was the evaluation lead on their programme. And so because of that, we've been able to draw some very direct comparisons um, to some parallel statements that they asked their student cohort. 
And although they were different students and space awareness had a much larger sample, um, it was very evident that actually their views were very similar and their perceptions haven't really changed among European students in the past four years or so. And then the next thing we looked at was gender. So given that we had an even split essentially of gender, we wanted to look at what any differences or commonalities that lied there. So as is all too familiar, we saw that male students typically indicated the more favourable responses. However, we did see that males typically perceived there to be less diversity in the space science industry. And they also, also showed a much stronger agreement with the statement that asked about whether space science discoveries have been made by men. And they were also much more positive about wanting to pursue a career in space science and also feeling they were capable of doing that. So this kind of led us to believe that actually it's possible that because these male students perceive it to be a male dominated industry, subsequently they're more likely to envisage themselves in that field in the future. So just to summarise that whistle stop tour of the Our Space, Our Future programme, um, really what we have found is that in order to shift from interest to focusing on identity is that we need to promote these scientific skills and scientific inquiry in the classroom with students. And we need to specifically engage with not only teachers, but also the parents and the wider community to essentially create this community of practice um, that students can immerse themselves in and everything around them is kind of part of what they're involved with. And then we also need to make it relevant to them. So not just kind of seeing it as a valuable, important thing for society, but to they themselves, so they can relate to that, they recognise it and they can identify and feel kind of part of an association. And then in terms of our baseline evaluation, we've seen now that generally students have favourable attitudes in terms of interest, but the key thing we need to promote is this kind of career aspirations and making them feel empowered, shifting their perception that space science isn't an industry that's accessible or inspirational to them. And that's what our next phase of the evaluation will do when we implement our post evaluation data. So after they've had all the interventions, we'll be able to measure, make direct comparisons to see this difference and assess the impact, but also how we had that impact. So not just whether we had a success story or not, but why, what experience led to them to promote that career aspiration among them. Excellent. Thanks very much. That's really thought provoking. And I know it's a topic that we talk about so often in the space industry. How do we increase diversity? Uh, how do we encourage more young people to not just be interested in space, but, but to convert that? And I think the difference that you've really brought in, in terms of your project is actually having the data. Because I think it's, it, it's always that challenge, isn't it, that we, we can talk about these things, but we don't have enough to really uh, be able to decide what the right thing to do is. Um, now, I've got one question already. So somebody's been quick on the question button. Uh, please feel free, everybody else in the audience, to, to put forward your questions. I'm sure there's lots of uh, thought provoking uh, comments that will come out post that presentation. But to head straight over to Robert Massey, who said, do you think it's still fair to say that space and astronomy are inherently inspiring for young people and keep them uh, in STEM? And do we have up to date evidence on this? Because we often hark back to some uh, older evidence. So, so kind of what I was just saying in terms of that evidence base. Um, Sharon, do you want, or Sophie, um, Sophie, that one off. Sorry, yeah, I'll, I'm happy to take that, Sharon, if you want to follow yeah, up. Yeah. Um, just because uh, my, my PhD kind of focused on using astronomy and space as a context for the science curriculum. So using as, it as that point of engagement. Um, and I'd like to say, yes, it is still, even among those students that have, it's not only inspiring to students who do want to pursue STEM, it's also those who claim they have no interest at all. They actually become quite animated when talking about space and astronomy. Um, and it's also, it has this wow factor, which was a really key thing that we see now. It's that novelty and being, especially when we mentioned being able to do real science, being able to do real inquiry stuff. Space is such a huge, vast, kind of incomprehensible um, subject. Being able to kind of bring that into their classroom and them to feel a part of that. Um, there, there's been kind of quotes from students that are like, wow, I feel like Einstein. And, and 
kind of disheartingly in some ways. I've, I've seen students say to their peers, oh, I, I wish I'd taken physics now <laughs> when they have chosen not to. And it's kind of just, I, I do, I'm biased, obviously, but it, it there is still very a lot of evidence. Mm. There's nothing to say otherwise it still really is a really good hook there's it's one that we see a lot of gender differences so we know that um, male students tend to go for the mechanical the engineering type subjects females seem to go for kind of the more healthcare and biological related subjects but astronomy seems to have this universal hook to all Mm -hmm. students so I think very much so and there's it still seems to be bringing in positive but you're right we do need more up-to-date data and that was a key thing from our literature review we found a lot of interesting reports but there wasn't that kind of robustness there wasn't that validity in the the, the measurements that they'd taken um, and it's really hard obviously it's, it's not easy to do and obviously a lot of the time there's not funding either um, Sharon I don't know if you have anything to add yeah, no, I think I think you've covered that brilliantly. Uh, I think there's an interesting thing about space being so interesting and also so out there. And it's got this amazing juxtaposition of maybe it's not really for me. Maybe it's just out there. Maybe it's just for the clever people. Maybe it's something just aspirational. And yet it's got these big unanswerable questions, which is such a grounder because people, children are problem solvers. They're curious and it taps into that automatically. So, uh, so for, for Rob's question, yeah, I absolutely agree that it is there, but there is a disconnect for not feeling that it could be for a realistic thing for your future. Which nicely tees up uh, Jeremy Curtis's question about, you know, why is there that low interest and how do we, how, do, how does the UK Space Agency look to address this? We heard from Paul Bay earlier saying that inspiration is such an important piece. Uh, do you have any sort of quick thoughts because I've got another couple of questions I'd love to get through as well um I would say it it kind of depends where you are on the pipeline um so there's obviously once you kind of get to undergrad these people they have an interest because they pursued it so at that point we know they're interested and when you get to a certain stage interest isn't really as important it it's more that sense of belonging the sense of competency and it's also less about kind of removed role models and it's more about mentorship um so fostering these beliefs fostering their capabilities and kind of giving them a sense of belonging and relatedness in a community i think that's the key thing the further along you get to kind of keep them and continue them in in the process yeah, and I, I uh, echo what we're trying to do with this program is to try not to take this to student in isolation and look at all the different partnerships and relationships. And it's it's really hard because it, you know for for those who are low science of low science capital, otherwise would not be able to see their their own role models, not think that that this is for them. Uh, it's quite in depth work, and I think the. Uh, the funding that that um, organisations such as UK Space Agency, but also um, uh, the Royal Astronomical Society, you know, really looking at, at role models, uh, inspirational role models, but also looking at, at funding these more deep interventions, multiple engagements, moving at the speed of trust and making a bit more of a, a difference for those those students who who otherwise uh, aren't surrounded by these sort of opportunities or, or or feel that it could be for them. Now we're running out of time, so if I could ask two very quick questions and and hopefully you can uh, give quick answers before we whiz on. Um, One was, was there any significant difference between the countries studied or was it very similar everywhere? Uh, And secondly, who who takes on the leadership of making a difference? Is it uh, it organisations like uh, Our Space, Our Future? Is it other areas? You know, who, who takes that? Who picks up the baton and runs with it? Or is it that we've all got to do it together? Um, I'll take the stats one and then if Sharon wants to take the leadership one. Um, we we saw significant differences with gender. Uh, we didn't run any country differences because some countries didn't have as many, uh, as big a sample size. So we're going to do the statistical tests for country differences in our final evaluation report once we've got all the post data as well. But we didn't quite have a big enough sample size to do that by individual country at that stage, I'm afraid. Yeah. There's some interesting uh, differences in 
in what people considered their underserved audiences in different countries already as well. It's quite interesting. Uh, in terms of who takes leadership, I do I do think that there's a big responsibility on funders and 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 looking at the way in which we we look at really we've got to be more evidence informed about our approach to to space engagement and we don't have the data really to springboard off it. Uh, and but I do think that also there's there's a lot of situations when we're looking at more diverse public uh, where we have to challenge the power uh, dynamic and make sure that we're, you know, it's it's the, the communities themselves and the individuals themselves uh, that feel empowered to, to take their own leadership and to bring the relevance of their own cultures and their own understanding of astronomy and space and for that to count and for that to matter. So um, so in, in answer to that very difficult question that you left me with, Sophie, uh, right. I would say we are we are in it together, but uh, there's a lot that the, the funders and, and, and STFC, UK Space Agency, and, and all the big players can do uh, to make a real difference.